Uh, welcome back to Distributed and Multi-GPU Deep Learning. So we'll be moving on to Data Parallel Distributed Training. So there are actually two uh, types of distributed training. Distributed uh, training. So we'll be talking about the first type here, uh, which is the Data Parallel Distributed Training. So in data parallelism, there's actually multiple uh, GPUs. So in this case, we see GPU 0, 1, 2 and 3 and within each GPU you have the different layers of the neural network. So in this mode the training data is actually divided into multiple subsets and each of them is actually run through a same replicated model so the same the same model is actually replicated in each of the different GPUs and the key here is actually the model itself is not so large that it needs to be spread over several GPUs. So the model alone uh, can be contained within uh, one single machine. Uh, it's just that the training data is very large and it needs to be spread out over the multiple GPUs. And also because the training data is very large, it takes a long time to train the entire neural network on one GPU alone. So hence, we are going to replicate the model and do the training over multiple, uh, multiple copies of this, uh, of this model. So in some sense, this is a CPU bound problem because we actually need to do the training or learning on multiple machines. Uh, but it is also memory bound in the sense that uh, the training data actually cannot fit on a single machine alone. So the training data needs to be spread out. And uh, the only thing that can be contained within one GPU is actually the memory required to store the model itself. So the model is replicated. It's the same model being copied across to the multiple uh, machines. So there is a need for this synchronization, right? Since the model is replicated, we must make sure that the model are uh, actually trained to the same state, right? Not We don't want to have them having any conflict. So there's a need to synchronize all these model parameters or gradients at the end of each batch computation. So to ensure that they're actually trained to a consistent model. So ultimately, we only have one single neural network, so we cannot afford to have uh, each GPU having a slightly different replica of the uh, neural network model. Uh, because each node will independently compute the errors between its predictions for the training samples and also update the, the gradients, right? Update the weights. We must do this synchronization step at the end of each uh, iteration so that they will actually uh, sort of uh, normalize, right? All the values are uh, synchronize all the values between all the weights in each of the replicated models so that they will actually have the same model. Well, one common way of synchronizing is just to, if layer one has value A and layer one on the other GPU has value B, we can take the average of the two values. So this is one way that we can actually synchronize it. Or we can take a majority decision. So if A, B, I mean the GPU one, two and three have one set of values and 2 is different, we can take the majority, which means that two, uh, 0, 1, 2 and 3 actually have the correct value and we'll just synchronize 2 to actually copy, uh, use that same value as well. So there are different uh, logic that we can apply, but what is important is that we need to go through this synchronization step so that all the replicas will have a consistent view of the state of the neural network or the model uh, at different iterations. Otherwise, we would have a problem at the end because each of them will have a slightly different view of what the final neural network should be. Therefore, each device must send the changes. Right? They must synchronize or coordinate with each other, send its changes to all the other models on all the nodes. So the values on one node must be sent to the other nodes so that they know what is the difference between their own value and the values on that particular node. So this mechanism, uh, there are several ways to do it, and we'll talk more about it uh, later on. So one interesting property of this setting is that it will scale with the amount of data available, and it speeds up the rate at which the entire data set contributes to the optimization. Two, also it requires less communication between the nodes as it benefits from the high number of computations per weight. So what this means is that actually each node, it can calculate the weights and the gradients on its own without having to send communication from one node to the next. So this actually reduces 
uh, the need for very high speed uh, memory bandwidth between the nodes and it saves that uh, communication cost. On the other hand, the entire model needs to fit within the memory of each node entirely. So this is one constraint. The model itself has to be small enough to fit within one node. We are replicating the model and its weights across all the different nodes. What is very large is actually the uh, training data. So it is mainly used for speeding up the computation of a large convolutional neural network with a large training set. So it's actually for spreading the computational load or CPU bound problems. So the training set is large. Uh, it may not be able to fit within one single node. So we, we can spread out by training uh, it across different machines. But mainly what we are trying to do is to spread out the computation time, right? The, training uh, computations required for this large data set. Uh, and we do the computations over multiple nodes, do some uh, synchronization at the end of uh, the steps so that we each of the replicas will have the same notion of what the weights should be rather than each of it being trained independently. Here we will be examining how the synchronization is actually being done at the end of each batch, right? So in a distributed environment, and there, and there are actually multiple uh, copies of the model, there may be several instances of the stochastic gradient descent running on each of the independent uh, nodes. Thus, the overall algorithm must be adapted to consider uh, issues related to synchronizing between those models. So the overall algorithm, the normal stochastic gradient descent, we cannot just run it because now we are going to run a disputed version of it, and this synchronization is the key step. So, so this is actually referring to stochastic gradient. Thus, the overall algorithm, the stochastic gradient descent, uh, must be adapted and should consider the different issues related to the model consistency or parameters distribution. The parameters for uh, the compute for the computer to each model on each node must be propagated to all the other nodes at the end of each iteration in order to maintain model consistency. What this means is that the weights or the parameters that you compute uh, in each of the uh, for each of the each of the model uh, for each of the layers in the model that you have on each node must be propagated to the other nodes so that they will know what is the difference between their own local copy of the model with the parameters of the model on the other nodes, and this is done in order to uh, maintain model consist consistency. And we're going to talk about two schemes, a centralized scheme versus a decentralized scheme uh, to do this. So if we first talk about the centralized scheme. So in the centralized scheme, we have a parameter server, which sort of acts like the general to control all the workers or troops that do the work. So in the centralized scheme, we would typically include a so-called parameter server strategy. So there's a parameter server. When the parallel SGD uses parameter servers, the algorithm starts by broadcasting the model to the workers. So at the first stage, we send data about the model to each of the workers from the parameter server. Each worker then reads its own split of the mini batch. So we have a the very large data set. So each of the workers will use one portion or a mini batch from the training data for its training iteration. It will compute its own gradients. And at the end of the cycle, you will send those gradients to the parameter server. Uh, there may be replicas if we want to have backup of this parameter server, so one or more servers. But, but one main server, you will, each worker will send the computed local gradients using the local mini batch to the parameter server. And each of them will send a slightly different uh, set of values since each of them are being trained using a slightly different copy of the training data, a separate uh, mini batch. Even if the data in each of the copies, all the model data is the same for each of the nodes, but they will still end up having different gradients because they're using different mini batch uh, values of the training data. So once all the train parameter server has aggregated the gradients from all the workers and it will actually wait until it receives everything, uh, it will then compute a global version of these gradients because actually the gradient should be the same for every single replica since after all we want to update to one common model. So it will aggregate the data, 
combine them together and then send that global version of the gradient data to each and every one of the GPUs or nodes so that each of them can then update their own local copy of the model and then the cycle repeats itself again until the, all the epochs have been completed and we have converged it uh, to the minimum um, error or the minimum loss. So the idea here is that the synchronization is done at one single location, hence this is called a centralized scheme. So the parameter server acts like a general to combine the results uh, from the field, from each of the individual workers, and then sends this so-called global command to each of them so that they can actually uh, update their own local copy. And then we repeat the cycle again with the next batch of uh, the next training batch. So this is a centralized scheme. We'll talk about another scheme next. So in the decentralized scheme, uh, like this one, there's no central server. There's no central parameter server or single point of contact where all the data is sent to and then we aggregate it and uh, combine it at one central place. So this scheme relies on a sort of network structure. So in this case, we use a ring uh, to do this for the, to facilitate the communication. So the first GPU sends its parameters to the next GPU and this GPU then sends the parameter to the next one and then this one will send it to the fourth one, the fourth one will send it to the fifth one and the fifth one actually close the ring and send back the gradients to the first GPU. Now if each of these different GPUs uh, actually combines the result from the previous GPU, all of them will eventually receive a copy of information from each of the previous GPUs. So by going in the ring, we sort of complete the loop and uh, have an update that includes the information from each of the GPUs. Now, without the central server, there's a, one advantage in that is the, you remember that for the central server, it has to wait for the results from each of the workers. So if one of the workers is slower than the rest, it's going to slow down the rest. But in this case, there's no waiting. We are just going to take the immediate results from the last server. And once it has been received, we'll just pass it on to the next server. So uh, it doesn't have this need for uh, a, a wait in the structure. In the decentralized scheme, we will rely uh, on a ring all reduced to, uh, to communicate the parameter updates among these nodes. In the ring all reduced structure, there's no central server to aggregate the gradient from the workers. So the gradients are actually being so aggregated at each node uh, since, and because it is in the ring structure, uh, they will eventually have a consistent value since the values that are being used to update this node get propagated on the next hop and the next hop and the next hop and the next one and finally the last hop has all the information. Now here's a quiz to test your understanding. Data parallelism is useful when okay, A. The entire model can fit into a single node and the training data is large so that it would take a long time to compute the training using only one GPU. B. The entire model cannot fit into one single machine node and the training data is large so it would take a long time to complete the training using one GPU. C. The entire model can fit into one single machine and the training data is small so that it will take a short time to complete the training using only one GPU. D, all of the above, or E, none of the above. So pause a while, think about the answer before moving on. Is it A, B, C, D, or E? For data parallelism, this mode. Then we come to the last slide. So in this particular uh, model, data parallelism is mainly used to try to address the CPU bound problem. That is, we need to do the training, but the computations required is too large to actually squeeze into just one single GPU. So we try to spread out the computation of the weights across multiple GPUs. Uh, but it does also, to some extent, uh, address these memory bound problem as well, because it can handle a large training data set that cannot fit into one single node. And the reason why it can do this is because the neural networks can inherently do incremental learning. And if we use mini batch and incremental learning, we can spread out 
the batches across multiple machines. So what all you actually need to actually ensure that uh, you have a consistent uh, model at the end of the day is to make sure that you have some sort of synchronization mechanism so that the SGD algorithm can run in a distributed manner and still give you a consistent result. So the synchronization mechanism is uh, pretty key to make sure that it works. So with that, thank you for your attention.